YouTube is a difficult place. You get seen by the algorithm and it, you somehow blow up. So I knew that I had to get people to see me. So I marketed myself initially. That's how I got my first thousand. I did see it as a business. YouTube was my product. I had to market it. Having a smaller community is actually more beneficial. You can one, nurture it better, look after them better, engage with them better. You can also keep it sustainable. When you have a community and an engaged community, a smaller community that really values your content, the brands value that more. Your first 1,000, 2,000 people you're most loyal, they're going to be the ones that convert the most. I was started to getting burnout. I probably didn't realize I was getting burnout. And then one day, like I kid you not, it was just a switch. It wasn't just like a gradual thing that I realized and maybe it was happening inside of me gradually, okay. but like mentally, it was just a switch in my brain. And I just could not even open up YouTube or even Instagram or even the news channels for a good year. Kajal, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me so much. No, I appreciate being here. I know it's taken you like an hour and 25 minutes <laughs> along the M25, which is just a nightmare on a Saturday. No, thanks. So I'm so interested to know more about your story because you've had a really interesting journey with YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I think your journey is one that doesn't really get as much attention in the social media space, especially in a longer form content like mm -hmm. podcasting. I'm really interested to learn more. But before we get into YouTube and also your work as well, working in the consulting space, tell us a little bit about yourself. Wow, what a loaded question. <laughs> Where, to start? <laughs> Where to start? Not a lot to say. <laughs> Where did you grow up? Um, so I was actually born in North London and then my family moved to Essex. So I actually grew up by the seaside and it's called South End on Sea. Yeah. And it was it was really nice back then, but then we've moved actually much closer in to the like the border of like Essex and London now. My family are actually from um, India. So my mum and dad actually both came to the UK. They actually met here, which was random. They met at Garba. Oh. Uh, so my dad's been my mum's Mauritian. And where did you go to university? I'm guessing it's around London. Yeah, I did London as well. So I went to Imperial. My aunt lives probably like 20 minutes away. So when I was young, like going to the, you know, the history museum or the science museum was something which I absolutely love to do. So it felt like home, like the whole area felt like home. So when I went to uni, there was some comfort around, you know, being in a location that you know, but also there's so much there to explore. When you finished at Imperial, yeah. what did you decide to do? So when I was at Imperial, I think like the first year I got like a summer school, which is like, you know, a three, four day thing you end up doing at like an investment bank. And that's yeah. what I'm doing. But when I went to, when I went to my second year and my third year, I had no internships lined up. I was just like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to make my own business. Yeah. Like, I don't need any internships. And then I got to the end of uni and I was like, shit, like, <laughs> I don't have any internships. I probably need to make some money. After that, I basically was like, okay, let me give myself like a year just to like see if I can like start my own startup. And I ended up like doing a couple of things. But like my biggest issue was like, I just could not scale. So I could not like turn what would be, let's say, I'm just saying like a hundred pounds into like a thousand pounds, right? Like which I couldn't turn it into six figures at that point. So I was like, let me go to a, a corporate company where, you know, they do this. This is what they get paid to do like in like day in, day out. I joined Deloitte and I've been there for eight years now. It's a good place to start your foundations in and learn. I think my parents have always said education is the most important thing in, in like for my for me yeah so like you know they they might not be able to like you know afford like so much growing up but they always sent me to tuition they always sent me to cumon because they knew that like education was all going to get me ahead so for me like you know you know when you go to uni you know like you start in school you do your 11 plus your you know you get into like a good school and then you end up like going to like hopefully a good uni getting good grades and like doing the textbook thing, because you know it's going to open up your options. But when you leave uni, you're like, oh my God, I don't know what, what the thing to do is. There's no path here. And there's no structure. And there's no you structure. You just had a whole experience structure. But Deloitte gave me structure because I went to Deloitte and I was like, okay, I'll do a grad scheme. And then I need to become a consultant, a manager, a senior manager. And it almost felt like comforting that there was structure there. Mm -hmm. So much so that I probably didn't take as much risk because... Yeah. I was like, there is a path, there's some structure here. And that gave me comfort because I'm used to that. And I'm used to how my parents brought me up, yeah. you know, thinking about things like that. So maybe like there's one thing I, said to, I say to myself like way earlier is like, you know, 
take that risk like leave the job it's okay to maybe like not know what's coming next and living with that uncertainty mm-hmm. um, it's something which I kind of look back now and I'm like okay I need to have a bit more belief in myself my capabilities and like whoever's listening the same thing to you like if you're worried about making that jump or thinking about I don't know what's coming next it's okay like no one has a life figured out and it's okay not to go like a structured path it's okay to have like a little squiggly squiggly line which maybe takes you back in a circle you started to get interested in youtube yeah yeah talk us through that what made you initially interested i know at that time youtube was popping off yeah so i am someone who always likes to do something so when covid happened i had nothing to do so i was literally at my home doing nothing yeah and I also think I'm quite an entrepreneur by heart. So growing up, like I was that kid selling sweets in school. I was that kid trying to make a business on the side. Yeah. And then even at uni, I joined like my incubator at Imperial. Outside of that, I was like mentoring startups at Techstar. So oh, I was always an entrepreneur. And even at Deloitte, I build startups for big companies. So I feel like I'm an entrepreneur, so like an inside corporate yeah, entrepreneur. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I probably don't want to stay in consulting my whole life. And I want to start my own business. And at that time during COVID, I was like, I want to start my own consulting company. How am I going to get clients eventually? And I knew it was not like a one-year game. I knew it was probably like a five-year game game uh, for me to get clients. So I was like, how do I do that? So one, I was like, okay, I can help people get into consulting and maybe that can build me a brand. Yeah. Two, I was like, okay, I'm a bit bored at home. Let me just kind of like try this out, see how this goes. And three, I was like, let me treat it like a business because if I don't treat it like a business, I'm not going to get sales, aka people looking at my YouTube. And I, I literally treated YouTube as a business even before I filmed my first video. And I was like, what are the three topics I'm going to focus on? What do people want to hear? Where do I think there's a gap in the market? And I, I genuinely think, I think at that time, I was probably one of the first UK YouTubers talking about consulting. At, at the same time, I did want to kind of like give back because I knew that when I was in uni, I didn't even know consulting was a job at all. Uh, yeah. And I know that there are so many other people out there from like underprivileged backgrounds who don't realize that, you know, there are so many opportunities for them and they don't know how to get into it. So I think it started, it actually started off like, hey, how do I help people? How do I kind of like get people doing this? But then also like, okay, how do I also use it to as a way to jump start me a personal brand? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Someone who has quite an entrepreneurial mindset, why specifically YouTube as a, as a way to explore that? I could probably talk about technicalities now because social media was popping off and it is popping off still. There's always space. The market's never saturated. You, yeah. can, always, you can always find space. At that point of time, the decision I was making was long form or short form content. Okay. I know that short form content, yes, you laugh for a couple of seconds, but unless you're pumping out all the time, you're not going to be remembered because you're not really forming a bond with the person on the other side. So when I do a YouTube video, it's like I'm literally having a chat with, with a mate on the other side. And, you know, people understand you and your personality a little bit more than they would through short form. So... Mm-hmm. For me, it was like YouTube was like clearly like the most obvious choice. Mm -hmm. One, because you build loyalty with your with your viewers and your audience. But two, I knew that I could convert that loyalty in the long run into different streams of revenue if I wanted to. Not that I did because I just feel bad selling stuff (laughs) online right now. But I feel like I need to to make money and keep it sustainable, you know. You were saying a little bit about the market not being saturated, mm. right? I feel like that is one reason why a lot of people decide not to start anything. Yeah. Or they sometimes say, oh, I should have done this 10 years ago. Yeah. But what is your take on that? I think content creation, social media is a cycle. I don't think there are many influencers, and I would say probably one out of a million, who manage to keep themselves running on social media for all. 40 years so I think as people drop there are people there's room for people to kind of come on secondly on social media people watch it for your personality everyone has individual individual personalities someone who just eats on YouTube and opens new doors and makes food and doesn't speak to the camera doesn't show her face and irons clothes there's a niche for that too and thousands of people watch videos like that because it feels comforting like you know being with someone in that same situation yeah so there's always a side of your story that you can spit that you can kind of talk about there's always your personality which is different and there's always room i think and you don't need to be different you just need to be you Mm -hmm. i think that's really important on youtube 
And I, I actually agree with you and you're saying that it's like a cycle yeah. because even some of the people that I was following in the podcast space before podcasting was even a thing, they grew so much. But then in the last five or six years, their following is just pretty much the same. Yeah. It's not really grown much beyond that. I've often wondered that myself. Is it a case that sometimes people just move on, like your audiences move on, or they consume your content in a different way as they get older as well? Because there's this whole thing in Hollywood where there's strategies that go behind Hollywood actors and actresses where to make sure they don't get too much exposure. Mm. But you don't have that in the, in the social media space because the platforms are designed to get you to keep uploading. Yeah. So sometimes yeah. I do wonder if maybe the audiences get a bit burned out as well. I think they do. I also think that having a smaller community is actually more beneficial. Interesting. That's okay. my personal view. Like I, yeah, like maybe when I was young, I probably wanted to blow up. But I think having a smaller community means that you can, one, nurture it better, mm -hmm. look after them better, engage with them better. You can also keep it sustainable. And also, I find like your, fir like your first 1,000, 2,000 people you're most loyal, they're going to be the ones that convert the most, I think, personally. And I think you can maintain a community when you have a smaller, smaller amount of people. And I think what, you, what wins in social media is community. And that might be either because you want to promote something and get a brand partnership, let's say from, from like an influence perspective, or from just like building relationships with your followers and your audience. Community is the most important thing, which, and in my opinion, which is the biggest thing that helps you win mm -hmm. no matter what you're doing, It'd be using that community or trying to convert that. Talk to us a little bit about the actual process of being a producer and being in front <laughs> of the camera. So one thing with building your own YouTube yeah. channel is that there is so much work that goes in yeah. both in front and behind the camera. And even when you stop filming, you are editing yeah. and then you're distributing. I don't think people realize sometimes how much work is involved. And you've obviously been doing this while balancing a full-time job. So can you talk us through, through a little bit about the process to building a YouTube channel, both behind the camera and in front of the camera? So my job basically makes me work from like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. easily. My YouTube channel was all about career. So I used to literally finish at 8 p.m., come home, script, probably till midnight, and I'll script for the whole week, typically till midnight, and edit like the last week's video. And then on the weekends, I'd be filming, especially on a day when I don't want to put makeup on. Because <laughs> I'm putting it on during, during the weekdays. And I basically made a lot of sacrifices back then. I didn't really like see my mates as much and all this stuff because I knew that to win on YouTube, content and consistency is king. Let me pump out something every week. Yeah. So I, I scripted, edited, filmed everything myself. Didn't have anyone. So yeah, I used to do everything myself. And balancing a full-time job was really difficult because yeah. what I realized is when I was doing my full-time job, my brand internally at Deloitte was pretty strong, but no one outside of Deloitte knew like who was Cardinal, what was Cardinal doing, what type of work she was doing, and you know why I have, why I should be the one talking about this. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was also not just filming and editing about YouTube videos, but also going to events and stuff, marketing myself on weekends or on weekdays and doing like speaking events and stuff. So I built credibility as well, because at the end of the day, especially in career, your track history and your track record in terms of where you've been, what company you work for, what job you have, does mean a lot. And it's really sad to say that. And I think they came to a point where I finished 8 p.m., scripted till midnight. I was literally writing about work. Yeah, so at the end of the day, it was like 8 a.m. till midnight, just thinking about work. And I didn't really have any time to do something which I loved doing. I think. Basically, it came to a point where I started hating writing scripting because yeah. I was just talking about work and all I was thinking about was work. That is very clear why maybe you suffered with a bit of burnout. Yeah. I will be asking about yeah. burnout. Before we get there, I want to learn a little bit more about your experiences with YouTube in the sense that you've clearly approached it from such a business angle, even the way you've been mm -hmm. scripting. What were your early experiences with your success on YouTube because I think it's really well known if you're in this space that building up a YouTube channel is so difficult. When you started uploading, yeah. did you find that success came quite no, quickly? No. YouTube is a difficult place to be unless you get seen by the algorithm and it, you somehow blow up. So I knew 
that I had to get people to see me. So I was the one basically creating an Instagram account on the side to promote my YouTube firstly, going to events and asking people if I could speak at their events. So people knew about me and my YouTube channel. So I marketed myself initially. That's how I got my first thousand or first, yeah, my first thousand probably came from me marketing myself, me talking at events. And you're already in the space as well. So that that's Yeah. But it wasn't it wasn't just like work events. It was like I went to unis. I spoke at unis. I spoke at like student consultancies who wanted to get into consulting as the career. And I basically was like, wherever my audience is, I'm going to be there. And I'm going to build a name for myself there. I did see it as a business. YouTube was my product. I had to market it. If you have a startup or a business, you know that your product is not everything. But like 95% of your success comes from marketing. And how long did it take you to build that first thousand? It probably took me like six to eight months. But my first 5,000 came in a year. I remember that being a milestone. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, but it's massive. I think if I'm right in saying when you get past your first thousand, that's also when you can start monetizing on YouTube. And that's a whole thing in itself. And for someone who started off trying to do this channel for a business purpose, you're working towards monetizing. So I think my main aim from YouTube was not to make money from it. Okay. It was to build my personal brand. Okay. So for me, it was around how do I get as many people to see me and, and understand the work that I do. I see. So you approached it like a business for that purpose, but it wasn't necessarily like a business with the thing, with the idea of making a net profit from it. Yeah. I don't think you go on YouTube initially to make money from it. The like easy way to make money is to like sell products on Amazon or something like yeah, that yeah. and drop ship. But for me, it was, I know long term, I probably wanted my own consulting business. How do I get people to see me? What I didn't realize was, is that I probably was building a niche around how to get into consulting rather than maybe future potential clients looking at my YouTube being like, okay, I want to work with her. Oh, but then I began to really enjoy it. Like, to be honest, I began to love like, you know, realizing the impact that I was kind of having on helping people get into consulting or, you know, helping them to think about where do they want to take their careers. I began to really love that. And even still to this date, though, I have not made money substantially from YouTube because I've not done courses yet. I've not done affiliate links and all this type of stuff as much because I almost feel like how can I sell to people who just who should be having this information for free. But now when you're thinking about, okay, where do I want to take my career? Mm -hmm. What do I want to do? Do I want to work for a corporate my whole life? I am now potentially thinking about like selling stuff or hopefully not selling stuff, which is gimmicky. <laughs> no, no. On the finances when it comes to YouTube, because it is an area that I feel a lot of people are interested in, mm -hmm. would you be able to share a little bit about your experiences with monetization? Yeah. So firstly, what actually people watch the most typically is like personal finance and everything to do with money, yeah. health and dating. Those are the three topics that sell the, the most. Okay? Yeah. But I think health and dating don't, like per view, you don't get as much money for it. Whereas anything to do with money, anything to do with career, anything to do with business, the money you get per view is much higher. So it's nice to be in this space. <laughs> but you do not make money from YouTube unless you're having like a million views. Like yeah. very honestly speaking, like even with 100,000 views, you're not making like a thousand pounds from a video. You're probably looking for like way, way way more views the money per view i get right now or even for the last year i still get money because people are still watching my videos it's not even a fifth of my income for my day job it's like incredibly low maybe even a tenth like honestly speaking but what brings money is the brand partnerships especially when you're working in money business and career the brand the brands that you work with can afford more because they could be banks they could be big businesses they could be like global companies and they can afford this stuff because they have bigger marketing budgets. Mm -hmm. So the money you get from them is mad. Like I remember getting paid 2K for a 10 second advert, which is way more than a single video has ever brought to me, just a pay per view. Which is why I'm saying when you have a community and an engaged community, a smaller community that really values your content, the brand's value that more and they feel they'll get more conversion so you can work with more brands with a smaller community i think for conversions yeah and if money is your thing that's what kind of what you're probably going for um at the end of the day and how do you start 
working with brands? Do they approach you or do you approach them or do you get a middle person to help you? I think some people get agencies to help with them and get signed. Like I'm not, I'm not big enough to do that. I have never approached a brand, but brands approached me. And I think that's just when I started kind of like getting a lot of views on YouTube. But there is no harm in you going out and messaging brands that you want to work with. But the way I would think about it is like, why should they work with you versus another influencer? What are you going to them? And think really carefully around, you know, the value exchange between you and between that that business as well. As we discussed earlier, building a YouTube channel takes a lot of time and energy. And you've been doing this while balancing a full-time job. You reached a point in your YouTube journey where you did want to take a break. I'd like to discuss a bit more about that and just have an idea of what your experience was like. Yeah, so I think every YouTuber I know has taken a break at some point. Either they've got a lot of content, which enables them not to show they've taken a break, or they just like say, hey, I'm taking a break or I'm quitting. And it's quite a big thing going on YouTube right now. So I think it basically came to a point where I got promoted to manager at Deloitte. I think there's a couple of things at play. One, I was like, how do I get to senior manager? Two, how do I get to senior manager as quickly as possible? Okay. Three, how do I get to senior manager without anything blocking me? And so one of the, one of the reasons, firstly, I stopped YouTube was I thought having a YouTube channel would look bad internally. Two, I'm like a zero or a hundred person. I'm not in between. I find it very difficult to balance things. I kind of give everything my all or I don't. So I knew that I wanted to get to senior manager and, and like, it might be greedy for me, like thinking about this, but I was just like, I need to kind of just like double down, not be distracted because I knew YouTube was taking at least 30, 40 hours of my week. And I knew right. if I put that time onto trying to get promoted earlier and doing what I needed to do, maybe I can get promoted early and maybe like, you know, it can be my route a bit quicker to the top. I was started to getting burnout. out. I probably didn't realize I was getting burnt out. And then one day, like, I kid you not, it was just a switch. It wasn't just like a gradual thing that I realized. And maybe it was happening inside of me gradually. But like mentally, it was just a switch in my brain. So I just literally went from like 100 to zero. And I just could not even open up YouTube or even Instagram or even the news channels for a good year. Like I could not open it for a year. I did not want to consume any content. I was feeding nothing inside. So I needed nothing outside of me. And then what I realized was I needed to kind of like reconnect with my friends, start doing things I really enjoyed again, but I didn't enjoy them like for the good like six months. And then slowly I was like, okay, like, you know, I'm going to just sit and read and open a book. Mm -hmm. And I started to like, I I used to force myself to do it. I used to force myself to do different things like bouldering or like going to an exhibition, which I would never really care about. I was like, okay, I'm just trying to like kind of like find myself again in a way. The way I'd say it is I was trying to find my mojo. Okay. I was trying to find the fire in me again because I'd lost that fire. And I think especially as a woman, when you care so much about your career and yes, sometimes your job is your identity and your career is your identity, losing that fire is very difficult mm-hmm. because then you feel like you're losing your ambition. And hence you feel like you're like not doing it as well. I think it's such a brave thing as well to take a break, especially when I'm sure it was in the back of your mind that, you know, you've built, spent all this time and all this effort doing this. Yeah, I regret it sometimes. I honestly, I regret it. Like I know that if I had kept going, I'd probably be able to kind of have a bigger like audience, bigger business. But also at the same time, what I've realized is your mental health is incredibly important. Yeah. And it's okay to take a break. It's okay not to have everything planned out. I think that's something which I really thought that I needed to have, almost seeing step after step and continuously achieving something. But it's okay to like coast and like make time for your friends and make time so that you're happy as well. So a couple of years have passed since your break. And in that time you got promoted, be working hard at that. But then something has started to play in the back of your mind about YouTube again. I knew I always wanted to get back onto YouTube. I knew that I didn't want to give it up. I remember like how much I loved to like just speak to people, you know, meeting people, meeting like, you know, getting to know new cool people in the space. And I was just like, I want to get back to it. Um, But I just knew that it was a matter of time until like I felt like I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I'd also do it sustainably. Like that was really important to me. Yeah. It was to do it sustainably. Things with YouTube, the algorithm makes you post once a week minimum. Like you need to, to be consistent. Otherwise you're not going to win on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, how can I get myself in a place to be able to do that? I'm also going through a thought right now. Like, is it okay if I don't post once a week? 
don't put any guardrails in terms of how I need to perform and just like see how it goes. The brain in me is like, yeah, you need to make sure this acts like a business. You need to give your best chance. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, why are you why are you doing it? What, right? What's, what's the point? Effort, yeah. yeah. What's the point of making all that effort? But the heart in me is just like, just go slow, like take it as it comes. I don't know kind of where I am in that space right now. But I'm also just kind of figuring out like, what do I want to talk about? I think when you work in a professional career, sometimes you feel like you can't be yourself fully online. So you almost feel like I representing my career brand on YouTube at the end of the day. So I can't do the weird, crazy, funny things that I would be with my friends. So I'm like, do I show that? Is there yeah. is there a time now where I kind of show that and show the full me? Like, I think I'm quite real on YouTube, but it's more like there are very crazy things that I would typically be doing. Like, I am inc- I am eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, do I show that part of me on YouTube or are people still watching me and going to be associated with me with, like, oh, my God, how can she be like that when, you know, she works at Deloitte or she's, like, a professional content creator? I think I've kind of go through a few processes like that. Yeah. And, like, being the full me would make me feel much more creative online. But maybe I'd do that under a different channel, let's say, to kind of keep it separate. Okay, so as this is the Don't Know podcast, Mm -hmm. a lot of us are trying to figure things out on the things that we really want from life. For anybody who is looking to build their own personal brand, what is a piece of advice that you have based on something that you didn't know at the start of your journey that you do know now? I think one thing to think about is that you're not alone in this. I probably thought that I could do everything myself. Okay. But I'm not talking about having editors or having someone in your team. Because I think most people know that they want to build a team eventually. I think you need to make sure that you are developing peer-to-peer relationships in whatever niche you want to get into. Because community is really important and it's really bad to say it, but you kind of scratch someone's back, they scratch your back. There are definitely times where I have, for instance, reached out to some really big consulting YouTubers who have kindly let me do a video with them and I've been able to capitalize on their audience, for instance. And I'm saying like that's the materialistic outcome. But what I developed from that was someone I could get to know, speak to who was going in the same journey as me, who could also speak about some of the challenges I was facing. Because you actually can't speak about a lot of it to your friends. Mm-hmm. They don't really realize all the ins and outs, all the small intricacies. Yeah. So having peers in the space One, allows you to build really cool friendships, but two, also allows you to kind of like build your audience at the same time. And I don't see it as like a, hey, I'm going to use your audience, you're going to use my audience. I see it as like, hey, I want to make friends in the space. I don't want to feel alone in the space. How can we kind of build a stronger community all together Mm -hmm. rather than as one person going in it by yourself? I think that's really good advice. Listening to you and others who have taken breaks and built their own channels, the similarities between when they say in entrepreneurship that it's lonely at the top or if you're a CEO, it's yeah. lonely at the top. That it's the same thing. this because you're the person driving everything. Yeah, I completely agree. And you want to find other content creators, other people in the space who can just kind of be mentors for you as well. The power of a mentor and just asking for one is so underplayed because that mentor essentially is someone who kind of guides you but also kind of like opens up your network believe it or not no matter what you do everyone says it but network is key like network is the biggest thing and like it's really bad to say but people kind of almost value you based on your network at the end of the day so you kind of want to keep building your network be it whatever space you're in you know whatever space you're in I'd like to point people in your direction can you share with us where people can find you on social media and on YouTube yeah, sure. So on Instagram and on YouTube, you can find me on Cultural Fodness, a P-H-A-D-N-I-S. And you can also find me on LinkedIn or just like email me at hello at cardualfodness.com. I'm always happy to go for a coffee chat if you come down to my office as well. So, so yeah. Thank you so much for being here. No, thank you so much for having me.